giddy art. Hey everyone, welcome to that paddle show. Dan here. Mick here. Joey here. Yeah. Oh my god. So the guitar lesson's not paying off then still, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I just can't find the right teacher. <laughs> welcome been, to that paddle show. How long's it been, Dan? Three years. It's been three years since we've seen your glorious face. And since I've seen your glorious faces. Too long. Way too long. So uh, we'll just do an introduction for the man who needs no introduction. Um, <laughs> because that's what always happens on these videos. Joey's an old friend of ours, and if you're new to TPS... Uh, this well, is the guy we keep banging on about. Yeah. That's go, him. Go back in the archive and watch the videos that we've done in the past with Joey. Joey Landreth of the Brothers Landreth and Joey Landreth fame. Uh, and, well, it feels like yesterday, but it's been three years. Yeah, it's crazy. I'm, I'm still 33. I've, I've decided that I'm still 33, and uh, those two years don't count. Um <laughs> But yeah, it, it feels like no time at all has passed. Yeah, it's kind of a drag. I mean, we we were in the middle of touring for 87 when I last saw you guys um, in uh, the fall of 19, 2019. And we were just kind of firing up the machine again and getting back on the road. We had all kinds of tour dates for 2020 booked. And of course, we all, we all kind of know how that went. So we had to pivot. And when it became pretty clear that we were we were getting ready for a long sit, um, Dave and I just started talking about, well, by the time we get back on the road and the dust settles and all that, are we even going to really want to try to put, get the momentum back going on this album cycle or, mm. or should we just make some new music? And I had been working on a bunch of solo material that I was going to put on a record. I had a concept for a record that I was going to make ever. I was going to do everything in my apartment because I had a little home studio that I just loved and was like, messing around with programming drums and sequencing stuff. And so I had a bunch of songs. I had three songs that were going to go on that record. And, but I didn't, I kind of, <laughs> kind of ran out of steam on it and ran out of ideas. So we started to talk about another record and I said, well, I do have these three songs, but they're kind of, they're kind of weird and they're not your typical sort of Brothers Landreth tunes. But if you like them, like, let's see if we can make them work. And that was, that was kind of the beginning of the process of putting that record together. And and then we made it and made it uh, uh, sort of pandemic be damned. We we managed <laughs> to make a record and finish it and mix it and master it and release it. And yeah, now we're getting to tour it. It's wow. a total blast. Uh, it's called Come Morning by the Brothers Landreth. And um, Dave's going to come in in a bit. Joey's brother Dave, who uh, is the other Brothers Landreth. Uh, and we'll talk a bit more about it then. But I guess for now, it seems like you've been at work, Joey. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty spectacular. It, my, it, it warms the cockles of my heart. <laughs> I knew it would. I, I saw a couple of things on Instagram. I was like, really? Like, we're no strangers to a, a crazy pedal board, but I guess we should just start at the beginning, shouldn't we? Yeah. Should we? Well, the I was saying to Dan, like, the... the um, the idea for the record was kind of born off of that sidecar board that we built, mm -hmm. uh, I think back in 2018, and I was chasing after a sound on a recording. I think it was, was that the last video we made or was that the video before last? I think it was the last. It's where you were made. doing like the room reverbs and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah, that's right. Um, and I was doing a wet dry thing and one of the so the sound was off of a, a song forgiveness and i had created this guitar sound around d delaying the room mics on on the guitar cab pardon me and uh you had put an express pe an expression pedal on the wetter box mm -hmm. and while we were doing that tour i just found this really amazing thing to happen if i just subtly blended in some of that room reverb with a bit of delay, like a bit of a pre-delay on it, just created this really spacious sound without creating all this ambient stuff floating around. It just made the guitar sound wider. And so that was kind of the beginning of the idea behind this this board. And then while we were making 80, or Come Morning, we were, we were just capturing things in a different way. And there was a lot, like not bombastic room sounds, but a lot of like, a lot of sort of air around the guitar right. and I wanted to try to recreate some of that and so I started experimenting with doing that sort of like really short delay blending it in and then messing around with doing two short delays and blending them in and sort of wrapping it around the guitar sound and it just be 
sort of was something that I found incredibly inspiring, super fun to stand in front of. And yeah, and then so it kind of started there and then it really became about chasing around some of these guitar sounds that we had achieved on the record. And the new record is not, it's not a really guitar forward album. Um, and so a lot of the sounds are a lot more subtle and it's not like the big sort of fuzz guitar that I have really celebrated in the past. It's a lot, like I said, it's a lot more subtle. Mm. So some of the creative elements for me, we're really about trying to find ways to recreate some of these these sounds that we made on the record. And some... well, what I like about that, Joey, is when you say it's not really a fuzz, fuzzy guitar sounds kind of record. I can see one, <laughs> two, three, four, at least five fuzzes on your board. So, and that's good. I, I think we're. <laughs> I think we're all about context here, aren't we? Yeah. yeah, what's wrong with me? There's one sorry, there's one you can't see on pedal cam to the side of the Vox Wah here where my foot is. Um there's another one. What is that? It's made by a company out of Austria called Isle of Tone. Oh right, and, okay. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's their um it's called the Lux sixty six, which I which I believe is a tone master kind of thing. Yeah. And uh those guys have become really um really dear friends and uh that one's got some of the album artwork from yeah, yeah. hindsight oh, wow. on it. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. You, you mentioned it. We have to hear it now. That's the rules. Michael, would you step on that, please? I, I am qualified for this. Okay. I don't know how loud it is. Are we blowing anything up there? No, just my mind. <laughs> <laughs> While you tell us the story, I've uh, we've got a flickering light at the back, which I'm going to fix. It's the okay. TPS way. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I shall try not to reveal any crack. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's not right. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's all right. I'll be back in a second. <laughs> oh yeah, that that is very precariously perched. Um, I connected, I connected with those guys on the last tour and, uh, uh, Joe Johannes, he came out to, um, our show, I believe in Munich and he brought a couple fuzzes for me to check out. And, uh, I, I mean, they're just, they're, they're just incredible and they're really lovely people mm. and they are interested in a lot of the same things that I'm interested in, which are getting deep in the minutia, you know? Nice. Their Instagram account is awesome. It's fantastic. Like and it's Isle, Isle of Tone, right? Yeah. Not like I love Tone, but Isle but of... Isle, like as in like uh, Isle an of island. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if you flip it over, I don't know if you'd be able to see it in the pedal cam, but it's got a translucent bottom so you can see, like, like the military spec style wiring that they do. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I mean, they even make their own battery clips. Like it is, it is, uh, the epitome of, of boutique. Um, oh, how lovely. Yeah. Pretty serious. Pretty serious and, and super fun. It's just, yeah. And it's, I mean, and it sounds awesome. Sorry. I'll just, I will just do this in case I forget to do a detail of it. There oh, you yeah. go. Look at that. Nice. You can, yeah. so, you can sort of see it. Um, yeah. Like you say, with um, some hindsight uh, album artwork there. Yeah, and he, he had messaged me and said, oh, I just love the artwork on it. And, and of course, like, you know, we did album art on the on the Mythos pedal, but he was just like, you know, I, I got this guy to screen printing. Like, would that be cool? I was like, yeah, absolutely. So get to tag my uh, my sister-in-law, Roberta Landreth, who does all the design for both my stuff and, and the brother's stuff. Oh, awesome. Has she done Come Morning as well? She did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and uh, yeah, so it's cool. It's just I, I love I love things that have stories to them. And and uh, over the years, uh, one of my the my most favorite things about what I get to do is I just get to collect these these people that just become a part of our sort of much like you guys. They just become part of the family. And uh, so it's it's really it's really I mean it it doesn't hurt that the stuff sounds awesome, but it's really <laughs> part of this part of the story that really makes it special. So. Okay. Well, let's hear some sounds. Uh, Joey played some stuff while we're setting up, and it's like, oh, 
you've reached sort of this point where <laughs> the sounds you're creating, uh, I couldn't fathom how you were doing it. <laughs> Yes. You know, it's like, oh, okay, you need to take me through this because that is fantastic. Should we, yeah. Should we start from the beginning? So we've got wet, dry, wet, right? Correct. Yep. Uh, yeah, that's as much as I understand. Wet, dry, wet, and it's all being fed by um, the, the two notes. Captor X is taking the signal from the amp and coming back into G3 in loop eight, which is where the humdinger is. So you're doing the Landau style after the speaker. Correct. For anyone who doesn't understand that, when you split wet, dry, wet, um, you can do it at various parts. You can do it on the board. You can do it out of direct sends out of the amp. But the way it was done, I guess, in the 80s by people like Michael Landau, and I guess that's probably the way Van Halen, and or at least they did it, all the wet effects were, were completely post. So after the speaker. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, as opposed to before that. So, yeah, yeah. So that's that's what I'm kind of trying to recreate here. So basically, the wet effects here, as much of what the amp is doing as mm -hmm. as is possible, while keeping stage sound out. So there's no drum bleed. There's no bleed from wedges. There's no audience bleed or anything like that. So, um, and it works really, really great. These effects are seeing the amp as much as they can. And then okay. that's going back to the two revs the two D20s to be amplified. Yeah, yeah. which yeah, which are feeding the wet cabs. Uh, and shout out to Barefaced Cabs for lending me those cabs for tour. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's that's kind of what um, the the basis of it. And then the, the, the G3 is doing uh, a ton of heavy lifting, like in terms of routing. And I'm, it's quite elaborate. <laughs> it's quite elaborate. Well, um, let's, shall we hear the center app? And yeah. then let's hear you blend in some sure. wet. Okay, this is just the center amp um, by itself. The looper is on the right. This one here? Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's sound. That's amazing. That's sound number one. That's amazing. It's the idea behind doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like well, I'm, and, I'm a little lost. So, what's creating the, the wave in the first place? What's creating the signal? The MC8 has um, this thing here. Yeah, yeah. The, the, this sort of second MIDI device has a waveform generator that will modulate the. So it's essentially doing. Like imagine what it's doing is it's reaching out and grabbing the knob yeah. and so turning CC it up and down. But it's taking panel. what you're playing. There's not being triggered by a sample or anything. Oh, no. Okay, so that's that's the part I forgot to mention is that that sound, this sound, is coming from the blooper. Okay. Yeah, right. I'm sorry. So that was the thing was like I couldn't figure out how to synthesize that sound. Yeah, yeah with the guitar in real time in a way that was would leave people still engaged in the show. Sure. Because I could, maybe I could find a way to build the sound, but by the time I'd built it, like people would have been, you know, four beers in and ready to leave. <laughs> so I, what I decided was to 
sample the sounds. So I, I recorded them from Pro Tools into the blooper and then saved them into the blooper. And okay. so there's a bunch of different ways that you can run the blooper as a looper. So you can you can layer things on top of each other. But then there's also a mode where you can, um, I think you can have up to 16 layers. You can have each layer be independent from one another. Wow. So in this sound, there are two layers. Sounds great. And that's two. So what what is it, what is quite astounding at this point is to think about all of that to operate it, and then let's not forget your singing as well. Yeah, it yeah, it took some work. I, I cannot wait to see the live show. I can't wait. Yeah. So, but and the and the part of the reason for this is because you're a three piece, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I was just I just wanted like I don't know. I I just love this shit, you know? <laughs> and like I think people are sometimes like is it worth it? It's like no. <laughs> no, but it's so fun. Yeah. You know, and like and it just like it just gets the creative juices yeah. flowing when when you start to go, okay, how do I make this sound? Yeah okay, I can't do it this way. Then you have to problem solve. And I think there's like, you know, I, I've had definitely had some people go, well, I just plug direct in. It's like, yeah, well, I can do that too. And I really enjoy doing that as well. But this fires me up creatively in a di different way. Sure. Yeah. And we were talking before, like off camera. It's like, if I'm having fun with the sounds that are being made by this crazy contraption, then I'm going to play like I'm having fun. Yeah, yeah. And if, absolutely. You know, yeah, yeah. It's like, and we've done rehearsals without any of this stuff and the, and the songs still survive. You know, it's mm. not like, oh my God, I can't play that song without these sounds, but it is way more fun to play it with them, <laughs> you know? How, do, from a tempo point of view then, does, uh, so uh, Roman Clark is playing drums um, in Brothers Landreth. Does he have to listen to that and lock into that or is it on some other external clock? N yeah, so we're not playing to a click. Um, <laughs> and and that's and that's where the trick comes in. So he he triggers a, a like a small handful of samples. Like there's a there's like a reverby tambourine that we really liked, that we wanted him to be able to hit. So he's got a little sample pad that has the tempo beeping. So I send him the tempo from my pedal board. Right. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah, but I mean it's not it's not an easy way to do it. The an easier way to do it would be to have us all on click and but but we just didn't want to have in ears. We want it to be playing yeah. together out in the world. So God the other the other reality you. is like sometimes we fall off. Yeah. And you just have to go, well, I can't, I just can't wait to see it. Yeah. It sounds so creative. It sounds, it's really, really fun. It's really fun. It's not without its challenges and it's not without, it's like, uh oh, <laughs> how do I get out of this? But that in and of itself is part of it. Yeah, you know, right. well, you're forced to play together as a unit at that point, aren't yeah. you? Is yeah. it, we, we did, sorry, this is, we'll get into the pedal board again in a sec. We, when we were talking about that, I was saying, oh, I've got monitor feeds for everyone, can, can sort your in ears out. And Joe's like, no, 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 we're on wedges now. And that togetherness, I've seen so many bands of late where everyone's in their own little world, mm -hmm. just concentrating on their parts. They've got no idea what's going on mm -hmm. and just trusting front of house to make it good. I guess you, you guys have stepped back from that and you're with each other again on stage in a, in a kind of single unit again. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and we've done that. And there's like, there's a, there's, it's, a, it's a, just a different way to make music and it's, very satisfying. It's not like I, I'm not looking down my nose at that at all. But when we, when Dave and I decided, okay, well, how, what's this version of the band going to look like? And we were immediately thinking, well, we're going to need more people to represent. We need a keyboard mm. player, and, and I, I played all the all the keys on the record too. So it was like this stuff has to be there because I worked really hard to get this stuff together. And it was like, ah, but like the trio is kind of my favorite. It's been my favorite sure. for a long, long time. And the Brothers Landreth, like in the very, very early days, it was just Dave and Ryan and I. So it was like, well, if if we can convince Roman to come and come and play with us, because he's such a great singer, then we don't need a fourth person to cover right. harmonies. Yeah. We have a singing drummer, then we're golden. So <laughs> we started to lean into that. And I just, I was just uh, kind of brought back to um, what I love the most about music, which is just, you know, playing with your friends. Mm. One, two, three. The trio, the trio is really like, you know, especially because we we're also capable of playing very very quiet. So 
that there's an that's the other side of not needing in ears is is that like we can play quietly enough that we can still sing together really well on wedges. Yeah, right. And well, um, one of the most impressive things I've seen at one of your shows, actually the first show we saw you at the railway, was it? Yep. Yeah, yeah, in yeah, Winchester. In Winchester. Winchester. Yeah. And my car got keyed that night. <laughs> that's what you remember. It was me. Yeah. <laughs> Did it say O Canada in it? <laughs> This will learn you. <laughs> anyway, sorry, Dan. But no, I just remember um, after a song and you guys all stepped up around one microphone and just yeah, did this thing. It was, it was like, very lovely. Oh, it was just so beautiful. But we could hear acoustically what was, what was happening off the stage, mm -hmm. you know, and it's that, that thing where you're all so aware of what's going on, you're sort of mixing yourselves around the one microphone. And there's a sensitivity that you need to be able to do that sort of stuff. And a few, you know, amazing, you know, the, the sounds that you get are phenomenal. Add that with a sensitivity to be able to do what you guys do in a three piece and the harmonies is like very, very special thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for saying so. And it's very special for us. And that's, I think that's what keeps us sort of doing it. And I think that over, over the years, maybe we've, I have lost a bit of perspective on that. And I'm very, I can be a very a type individual who wants everything just so but you know in the in the process of making our new record um because of the way that we made it uh it was just impossible for me to be in control of absolutely yeah, every element okay. of it you know and we had we had we had a false start on the record we started making it and you know the songs weren't ready the arrangements weren't ready um and so we we had to start over and in in the time it took to cut the record all the all the bed tracks for the record and then decide that we needed to try again the lockdown had come back wow. and in manitoba we you couldn't gather in groups larger than three people oh, so it was dave and i and our our producer so we couldn't have an engineer we couldn't have a drummer we couldn't have an assistant so it was like well how do we make a record if with with a fourth person if we can only have three people so we said, okay, well, you know, I, I farm out tracks to people all the time. I'm sure we could call somebody to play drums on it. And it was like, well, if we're going to call somebody from, from afar, why don't, why don't we reach out to somebody who we'd never have the chance to play with? So we, we I was reached. stunned to see Lars Ulrich on the album. <laughs> it was, uh. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? He, he, he played for a hundred bucks a tune. It's crazy. <laughs> he, uh, that guy really needs work. No, I'm kidding. Um, but so we got Aaron Sterling to play on the record okay. of, of John Mayer fame and, and, and Taylor Swift and all that. And uh, immediately we started getting stuff back that we never, like my, my, uh, my sort of punchline is like, we got the tracks back and in the audio file folder, there were bongos. <laughs> and I was like, Hard no on bongos, bud. There's just not going to be bongos on a Brothers Landreth record. That's just like, I've, I've, the only time I like bongos is when it makes sense to have bongos, and this doesn't make any sense to have bongos. Um, and funny enough, actually, the bongos were the reason that we started bringing the little drum sampler. Because when I heard the bongos, it was like, oh my God, that is we just the bongos. coolest thing. And I, I, if somebody would have said, hey, I want to try this bongo part, I would have been like, don't waste your time. Don't even bother. Don't even, don't set the mics up. Let's not, like, no, bongos, no. But, you know, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a joke, but the reality was, like, I realized in that moment that if I had the chance to micro-manage Aaron... That wouldn't have happened. We would have missed the opportunity. You would have missed the wow. bongos. And, that's, but, that's growing up, that is. Well, and it was unintentional, but it was a really big lesson to learn. And in that, in that lesson was, like, not only did, would we have missed this opportunity to create this really special moment, but I'm actually learning that this thing that was so far outside my comfort zone has now expanded who I am. Like wow. now, I mean, it's just bongos, but it's like, but just the idea of allowing more collaboration. Bongos make it the man. Bongos make it the man. That's the next TPS shirt. Yeah, you may wish to call them congas, of course, but you know, that's up to you. Well, congas are the bigger ones. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. So there is a difference. The bongos are the little ones. Yeah, oh. little tiny, like, doom, tick, 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 tick. and bongos are like that. Boom, tick, 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 tick. Yeah. Well, well, that, those are those are technical terms, by the way. Every day is a school day, Joey. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so in that in that, then it was like, okay, bring it on, like surprise me, and 
instead of instead of calling him back and going, okay, I love the parts, but can you can you cut the hi-hat pattern in half and maybe the kick drum is needs to be this? It was like, I'm just gonna let this be what Aaron thinks it should be. All right. And then that's gonna be the new sound of this band. Wow. And then when we went when we went into the mixing, it was the same way. It was like I could sit here and go, I, I wanna hear less of this frequency on the vocal and more of this, more of that, or I can just let the record be what this mix I, we called this mixing engineer because we love what he does mm. and we respect everything that he does and i'm going to be better if i just let it be what he thinks it should be mm. and this just gets to be the record that greg kohler mixed and that's what he thinks it should be right. you know and this these drum tracks are what aaron sterling think like we call them because we love what he do, what he does mm. yeah, yeah. i'm i can't play the drums and I can't mix like that why am I getting involved so it's really really good for me Amazing. very similar conversations with Paul Stacey yeah it's like bands record all the stuff and he's like sends them out because now just let me mix yeah this is you know and mix yeah yeah I, I think we we uh, we get stuck in these loops of like because it's it's we were talking about this off camera before too but like it's hard to be vulnerable and it's hard to like, yeah. it's hard to do something different, especially when you think somebody is expecting you to do something. But, you know, nobody hates the new record. Like some people are like, well, this is different, but nobody, nobody goes, you know, what, what utter trash, at least not to our faces. So <laughs> who knows? Listen to Let it. us know in the comment section. Yeah. No, don't. I don't want to know. I don't make, care. Make your own money. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's the paradox of that is that it's a very freeing experience to let go as well, isn't it? Because yeah. you can just do your thing. Yeah. And then coming into the band and coming into this pedal board, everything about it was like, what what can we do to invite more collaboration more often and create moments that are special for us? Yeah, right. Because if, again, if we're having special moments on stage, then it's going to, I I truly believe it's going to translate and people are going to enjoy those things, you know? This is exciting. Yeah. Let's this have another exciting. special moment. Okay. Yeah. What's next? Well, um, <sighs> I'm just I'm in I'm still in a slight state of confusion because when you played the um, the just the direct amp earlier, yeah, the, the, uh, Joey's using the Two Rock TS One that's living here at TPS. He's also going to take it on tour, so I'm interested to hear what you Thank think you. about it. Um, there was delay on the the center amp as well, so it's not strict uh, no. wet dry wet. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that is that is a, that can that I had to sort of work around was. Um, there's no way to not send dry amp to the wet effects without turning the amp off. If you turn the amp off, no signal. No, no signal. signal. Yeah. yeah. So the blooper has a kill dry function. Mm -hmm. um, so I use the, and, and because the blooper is relying on the echo system to create the panning, I don't want the dry signal going through. So I can't have the delays coming out of the side amps. The way that I that I normally would, right? Um, and in that particular setting, the the loop and the main guitar are totally separate things anyway. So the blooper stops all the dry from going through to the wet cabs and lets the wet cabs just uh, carry the sample. And then so the thermae is my is my delay in the center amp. The other thing to get your head around is it's different for every single sound. Oh, good. You know, so yeah. so like you know. There's a signal path diagram which we'll show you. I've got to draw this. But it's it's a signal path diagram, like, you know, a, how everything is wired up. But this changes consistently, right? You change yeah. the order of things and you, yeah. you know, so this little box here uh, that Joey has built. I built. He built. Ah, I did this, wonder. This is a master volume for the left and right of the wet amps. So you've got control over how wet things get. Correct. Baby. The other sound that I wanted to really recreate as accurately as I could was the title track of the record is called Come Morning. And I recorded, um, we originally went into the session, I was going to do it solo acoustic. And previously, uh, it was a song known as All You Can Do Is Cry, but we had another song with the word cry in it, we were like, what else could we call this? <laughs> so it got re, it, uh, Roberta came up with the new title and we just loved it. Um, so I was originally going to record it on my acoustic, but it was, uh, it, it had a rattle in it that we couldn't chase out. And we sent, we sent it in to get fixed and it came back and it was still kind of rattling. And oh, wow. so we were like, well, you know, what do we, what do we do? And my, 
dear friend and um, often collaborator engineer, Paul Yee, he said, well, let's set up some mics. Why don't you go grab an, an electric guitar and let's see if we can come up with an interesting sound. So I played my um, that blue 335 style, the Mockingbird. Oh yeah, I nice. played that, and then I sang and played at the same time. So it was really, it was really, really special. Beautiful, love that. And so we had the guitar going slightly through an amp, and then Paul actually miked the body of the electric guitar, which was really wound up being so beautiful. Just oh. added this dimension to it. Love that. that. Yeah. And then everything went through the Benson. Um, stereo tall bird reverb and so what we wound up doing was we wound up blending in the electric amp sound in really subtly so it was actually the the majority of the guitar sound is actually the the no microphone on it. yeah and then the amp just sort of filled out some of the body huh? but it just it had this really far away kind of thing and so i wanted to be able to blend the the tremolos in and the reverb kind of separately so what i have going on here is that the harmonious monk, which is on underneath the board, is after the dry split. Mm -hmm. So it's only going to the wet amps. And I have it set to come out only the left side. And then I have um, a plate reverb on the right. So if you blend in slowly. I should also add that I have the phase reversed on that. Oh, yeah, wow. Because as you blend it in, it creates this. It's always a pleasure to hear you play, but it's a particular pleasure to hear you sound so awesome on the harmonious one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know what, and this is not, this is not a uh, an ad. It is, it is the best that there is, short of actually plugging into an old brown amp. Yes. Oh, and I, and I, of which I have two, and I have put them up against each other, and it's virtually indistinguishable. Oh, yeah. You know, the thing with harmonic trim is like is. I think a lot of people kind of simplify. They go, oh, it's just kind of like phase reversal. It's like does this sort of switch. It's like there's a there's a thing that happens that that doesn't happen in the top end yeah. that makes it special. And the, the harmonious monk is Mwah. Oh, man, thank you for saying that. Uh, it, it was... I'm sorry it's not on top of the board. Nobody can ever see it, but it's just... <laughs> it's, stealth, it's a stealth monk. We know it's there. It was yeah. Joey that we introduced us to, ha to yeah. harmonic trem. So the, the, the journey is... Uh, it means a lot to all of us. So um, and it's a it's a trip to hear it. Like it really that. is amazing. And the plate, what was doing the plate? The the, the CXM. Yeah, 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 yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, and so then the CXM is also. It's it. So this is where the G three, is excels. Well, not excels, but this one of the great things about it is that. Uh, so I have. I have the reverb going in front of the echo system. So that's how I'm controlling the blend. You can you can. You, I have certain presets that I modulate, or I, I use the my little expression roller to control the mix, which right. is fun because it moves in real time. Um, but the the way that the CXM handles stereo, it, it sums the inputs to mono, so I can't separate 
you know, if I wanted to do what I'm doing with the reverb the other way around, it, it wouldn't work. Okay. So that's that's how I'm getting away with having the, the tremolo on one side and the reverb on the other is by reversing the order. Because otherwise the CXM, even if you go in stereo, it still sums the mono. To be used in such a musical context as well, because I guess uh, being that pedal show, we have been guilty in the past of doing things that are for the sake of it. Mm -hmm. And never me. And uh, you know, it's interesting from a sort of you know, I never this is how things work point of view, and sure. what, what crazy things can you do for, yeah, the, yeah, for, the, yeah, yeah. for the the sake of doing it? What I am just astounded by is that this is all about playing a set of so songs. songs. Yeah, yeah, right. I I just love that. So on G three, then, do you have you got your presets arranged by song? Are you doing it yeah. like that way? Yeah. Yeah, because every song needs something else. And there's a lot of songs that are just, it's literally just my regular sound and a little bit of slap delay that I can blend in just to taste. And there are a lot, there are a lot of settings that are just like that. So, yeah. which is kind of, which is always funny because like some of these sounds, which took so much time to make, yeah, I bet. Are, are, are so subtle. And then the, the majority of the show is actually real straight ahead and there's mm -hmm. not a lot going on. But it's just in those moments where like, I, like this, that sound for Come Morning is just like, so much fun to stand in yeah, front of, of course, you know, yeah, yeah. and like, you know, I don't even like I well, we, we travel with our own our own sound tech most of the time. But there are times when we when, when Ian is not along with us. I have no idea what's going into the PA. Like I could try and go, hey, <laughs> just leave the wet cabs wherever the, the the dry cab is. Take put the put the wet cabs there, too. But then, you know, you hear things back. and You're like, well, there's supposed to be this and this and this going on. It's not happening. Oh, okay. um, but so that sound. There's another song that has a similar sound to that and a similar kind of routing to that. And there, this one is a similar sound. So that sound, again, super subtle, but on the record on You Don't Know Me, I got the guitar sound, also with the Mockingbird, actually, by running the Univibe, a Univibe on vibrato mode on one amp and then not on the other, and then a pair of room mics to capture the sound of my booth, which I really, really love. So the CXM is doing the booth, and then the... Um, penguin? The Penguin, no, the uh, 1968. Oh, uh, yeah, of course. Which also shout out to um, Jam Pedals Retro Vibe, which is what I've been using, but I, I switched to this because it's got two channels and sounds great. Oh, I love okay. everything Je Jesse does. Yeah, but the Jam King, Pedals. King Tone, the 1968 is by, yeah. by the way. The, the, the Jam Retro Vibe is, mwah, yeah. but I just love the idea of having uh, two speeds. So that's what this is doing. And it's doing it in the same way, only instead of having the reverb before, it is after to kind of try to simulate the room. Oh, okay. Yeah. That tune is, uh... When you stepped on the next preset? That's that's my just in case I just want to rip a solo at the end sound. Yeah, so I probably would turn the, the slap down a little bit, which I think might be that knob, yeah. I don't know where that hum is coming from, but...
ju I just cannot wait to hear it in context. I can't wait to mm. hear it, to hear how that sits in the mix because there is so much texture there. So, if anyone isn't aware, you tune low, like it's 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 in C, mm -hmm. but it's the same way as we would tune like an open E chord, yeah. but down to C. Right. Right. Yeah. What are the things that you need to keep in mind when you're tuning a guitar down that low? Or, um, or do you even need to keep things in mind? Uh, I mean, like, yeah, low end can get to be a problem. Okay. So generally my sort of uh, stock kind of approach is I get the amp to where it feels Mwah, and then I turn the bass down. Okay. Yeah. And then, you know, immediately you're like, ah. But then when the band starts to play all of those frequencies, you don't miss them because you're because sure. you're getting them from the kick drum, you're getting yep. from the from the bass, you're getting them from the PA. So it just helps keep things clean on stage. Honestly, you could do that in your standard setup too, I think. Sure. I think where guitar feels great generally doesn't play super well in terms of low end with okay. with other instruments as soon as they get introduced. So that's something that I do. Um, intonation has been a bit of a fun journey, which I think we talked about even on the last episode, and there's been some developments in that territory. But um, uh, but I think the intonation actually has a little more to do with the string gauges that I use. Yeah. But um, it's all been uh, quite a wild ride. So is it still, was it 17 on the top, 16 on the top? The, the high E? Yeah. It's 19. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and and on the bottom. Well, the bottom I've actually gone down quite a bit because in when I first started doing this, it was, um, it was the Daddario baritone set, which was fourteen to sixty eight. Yeah. And the fourteen was in in this scale length was just too slinky. It was like less than a nine. It was quite wow. quite awful. Yeah. So I just slowly got up in gauge and in standard tuning when I was doing open E, I was using a thirteen on top for slide and stuff, and and that was quite comfortable. So I was trying to get that kind of vibe. So this this feels heavy, but it's not it's not like like nineteen. It's and, certainly and, not yeah, like yeah. comfortable to play. It's beautiful to play. Yeah, it's 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 stiff, but it's not impossible yeah. to play. And the action is quite low. Or well, I mean, not super, for a slide player. For a slide player, it's quite low. But I, I during the pandemic because I was playing so much less, my my hands were weren't keeping up with the string gauges so I went down to 17 to 56 which I think is closer to like an 11 okay yeah. um and uh and I found that a lot easier I wasn't playing as much slide uh so it was way easier to play fretted in in that setting but it went we had I had Alex Sorokin and I worked on this custom rap tail bridge and when I went down in string gauge the reps that didn't work anymore. Oh no! So it was just like just out enough that it was frustrating. Okay. So what I found was that if I went back up and gauge on the top three strings, it was the right. bottom three strings could stay. So I'm actually I'm now 19 to 56, 19, oh, 22, right. 21, 24, 34, 44, 56. I believe. Yeah, 56 is is quite light for for down to C, right? Yeah, but I I fell down the I fell down the rabbit hole of like the Rick Beato, Rhett Shull lighter strings, and when I went down in string gauge, was like, I, the the bottom strings do sound better. Like they're just a little bit spankier. They're not quite as woofy, mm -hmm. which the 68 was like was there was not a lot of definition. And as I you know, so then I went down yeah, to 64. And it was like, oh, I'm getting a little more. What happens if I go to 60? Went to 60, like, oh, I like that better. And then I went down the whole the whole string set um, and just found a lot more clarity, which I liked. Because I don't want a ton of top end, but that sort of low mid, like between, I don't know, 300 and whatever, I don't know, 200 and 400 maybe, somewhere in there. Mud. Really makes things sound muddy. Yeah. Sure. So... Um, but because because I play with a metal slide and I also don't want a lot of zing, so so how are you balancing that up? Because hearing a sound that is so, um, I I wouldn't have automatically heard that sound and gone, okay, now I'm going to whip out my slide and check this out. You know what I mean? So how are you balancing up the slide stuff with uh, you know being having to set up for such a low tuned guitar or is it, it it just happens i mean i do a lot with the tone controls oh okay so you know where i would play 
Um. Those kind of sounds. For slide, I would probably knock the tone back like halfway. I don't know if that demonstrated what I was talking about at all, but I got, yeah, carried, yeah, I got that, carried away. <laughs> so it's simply that the, the slide sounds brighter than your fingers, so you need mm -hmm. to compensate on the guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so constantly cool. adjusting, and yeah. and I, I love I love the way that you can change the guitar sound with you know I mean even just knocking the volume back like a knot. <laughs> There's so much there, so much there. You know you never have to stop doing yeah, that you, stuff. Don't ever feel yeah, like... Yeah, don't ever stop. So, uh, talk, right, so right. talking about guitar controls, I see your guitar has changed shape, you've changed the pickups. It got drunk. Yeah. Yeah, it did. It yeah, went yeah, out. Yeah. fell down the stairs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a, a new, so, so you've had this ages, but we haven't seen it, the, the new Alex Sorokin. I just got this. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. I got it back in um, the beginning of July. Wow. Yeah. Have you had one before that? Yeah, my my other gold top. No, but with humbuckers. Nope. Oh really? Yeah. So we were just talking about it then. We've been talking about it. Yeah. I yeah, thought yeah. you had it. I thought no. you actually had it. I got it. I mean, that's honestly like that's the that is the genius of Alex. Because you know when you get a new guitar, it just takes time to break in. Mm -hmm. I got this guitar and was immediately like, I could take this on stage. And to be honest, I don't even notice that it's not my same guitar. No. It's so. It feels so similar. So uh, the, the guitar that Joe's been playing for, well, for the feels like the longest time. There's a bit of cold coffee here, mate. Would that would that help? Give me. Um, it, 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 for the longest time, it's been a, an Alex Sorokin guitar with P90s. So, how have you found that transi transition? Has there been much from P90s to humbuckers? Yeah, or uh, from the old guitar to this one. Well, so one of the things that Alex is uh, just meticulous for is he measures everything. So the, the story behind this is that um, he called me one day because because the other thing is, is Alex doesn't build guitars for commercial purposes. He, he sort of just builds them. Mm -hmm. He has one dealer. He has a, in, in Edmonton, Alberta, um, and he builds a guitar, gives it to this. The store is called Stang Guitars. Shout out to Stang Guitars. Um, and then they, they sell his stuff and he just builds whatever he wants, mm -hmm. sends them nice. off to them. And they just, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's very cathartic for him. So. He puts so much effort in into, and the, we've we talked about the other guitar on another episode. So if you want to go down the rabbit hole, you can. But he puts so much effort into just making them special and vintage, and you know, like little details, like how deep the nut goes into the nut slot. You know, he's like the modern Gibsons; they line up with the binding, but the vintage ones never did. So his, you know, that that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, I hope I'm not giving away your secrets, Alex. <laughs> um, but. Uh, he called me and said, um, so I have enough wood from the same billet of wood that made Goldie, which is my other gold top, not an original name at all, Goldie Han Solo, uh, affectionately. Um, and so I don't know, do you like, would you want another guitar? I was like, well, if you have the exact same billet of wood, yes, like that guitar is so special. I, like, even if it's just to have one that's 
a close backup, you know, would be great. And in that time, he, he got a, a hefty, a hefty email from our, uh, our big company friends who okay. said, you, you, you're not allowed to use that guitar shape. He was like, really? I literally make one, one guitar a year. Maybe they were like, absolutely. Nope. You seriously. Yeah. Yeah. They went, I, and I, I mean, it's, it's probably your guy's fault for, uh, for making that guitar. So we visible. get blamed a lot for stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell I'll, we'll split the blame 50, 50, <laughs> but so, so he, he at that point was like, I, I just don't, I, I don't think I have any, I don't have the, um, the stomach to try to make my own shape and have people tell me how much they hate it. I just don't. And I, and I said, listen, man, I don't care about what shape it is. You could make it a triangle. You could make it a rectangle. You can make it a circle. You make beautiful guitars. I love them. I, I, you can't stop making guitars. So, uh, and then Zach from mythos was also said the same thing. Like, just come up with something who cares, mm. you know, the lots of people have done it. And, um, so he worked really hard, came up with a shape, which I really, really love. And uh, it's kind he, of, it, al- it almost becomes slightly offset, doesn't it? Or yeah, just, just a tiny bit. Yeah, it, it has this like Jetsons vibe to yes, it. Yes, yeah. that's like, what I was thinking. The, the pick guard he worked really, really hard at, and when I saw it, it was like I love it because it's like mid-century yeah. modern Jetsons futuristic. I just think it's so cool and classy, and I, I really, I really, really like it. And he made he to sort of I think to test out the shape, he made a couple juniors, which I have one of them, which are also incredible. Um, so yeah, but he, so he took, he took the blueprint of Goldie, my other guitar and just anywhere where he thought he could make a slight improvement. He, he made a few changes. You know, one of the things we did on that guitar was the way the nut was cut is I wanted it to be, I wanted the, there to be little, very little radiusing on the strings. Okay. Because it, the more the radius is, the harder it is to kind of get into the details with playing slide. But that sort of raised some other challenges mm-hmm. with the guitar. So, the, the you know, there's certain buzzes I could never chase out of the low strings because they're just set deeper into the nut. And and while it was really effective for slide playing, it was just kind of funky, fretted. Um, not unplayable, but just kind of like, oh, this is a quirk of this instrument. So he lessened some of that on this guitar in, right. in a really effective way. And then the other thing he did, because the other guitar has quite a huge neck on it, he just brought the shoulders down a little bit. So it's like, feels identical sits on the leg identically it's literally like a like a tenth of a pound difference in weight um and the only thing that really changes is it's a little more comfortable to play so when i got it it was like i often don't even realize that i'm that i'm not playing the other one until i see a video or a picture and be like oh that's a different shaped guitar (laughs) you know yeah so it's i'm i'm really he, he was like man i really want to try and beat the other guitar but then i don't want to beat the other guitar because but so far, it's a winner because it's the only guitar I brought on this tour. So. What about sonically then, uh, humbuckers and and yeah, P nineties. These are these are Ron Ellis's, which are in. I have a set of his P nineties in in Goldie as well. Um, you know, there 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 is a little bit of a difference in how the how the tone controls react. Yeah. So so it like where the P nineties stay pretty. They they kind of retain some of their brightness when you back back the volume off. These these get a little darker, but it's not it's it it works. Sure, it's 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 cool. Um, but uh, they're a little less mid forward than yeah. than the P nineties, which I which I like. Because mm. um, in certain situations, my my P ninety gold top um, can get a little squawky, plugged into the wrong amp. It's yeah. it's a little it's a little mid mid rangey. So. This this kind of deals with some of that and makes it a little bit more versatile, which is cool. Is there any benefit in terms of noise? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's quieter. I mean, they do they do still make a little bit of noise, like they still hum, yeah. like like vintage PAFs kind of yes. do. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, but they they also you know they're they're not this like super thick mid rangey P ninety the way I think a lot of people or PAF the way I think a lot of people think PAFs are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're chimey and open and they have this really beautiful compression to them. They're kind of like they remind me more of Telecaster pickups yes. than than the sort of aftermarket uh humbuckers that I threw in my strat, you know, when I was yeah. in my early twenties. <laughs> you know, and they're really, really responsive, very mm. touch responsive. And yeah, Do you ever fun. play th- that strat anymore? Or is you is it most of the time on I, I use it all the time on sessions okay. but I'm just so comfortable with this format yeah. and I pick up a a guy a, a, a friend of mine loaned me a, a really really cool telly um, 
uh, and it sounds gorgeous, but it's just like, oh, it's, it's too long. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Did that make it onto the new record? The telly? Yeah. No, I didn't have it in time. Oh, uh, wow, because there's, there's, there's a couple guitar songs I'm thinking, that's got to be a telly, but it's not a telly. No, I mean, what did I use on that record? Uh, the Gold Top got used a lot. The um, Josh Williams... Mockingbird got used a ton. I yeah. love that guitar record. So, it must so be well. Goldie because I, I know that with yeah. being nice, you can get into that. You can certainly get yeah. into that bright world. Must be. Yeah, it must be. Wow, yeah. blimey. Yeah, uh, I'm interested in these fuzzes, Joey. Uh, are they are they all doing specific jobs, or uh, uh, is there any choice involved? Like you go, I want that one now. You know what? It's it's really just variety. Um, everything is kind of a flavor of one another. I mean, obviously the the Scott McKeon. Um, right now, I, I'm just using as the octave fuzz, yeah. which I was also using the 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 Mythos um, Argo, Argo, which yeah. which I the clean octave blend kind of thing I just love. But I I I also like the the right side of it. So it was like more fuzz is better than less fuzz. <laughs> is that, are you doing Runaway Train or something? Then are you no? No, you know what the octave fuzz is is literally just there just in case. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I step on it just kind of, and, and that's kind of why there are so many fuzzes and so little fuzz on the record, but so much fuzz on the board <laughs> is, is, is really just, again, more in the vein of if I, if I kind of am looking for something that's, that's going to uh, change the way I'm feeling on stage, it's nice to have something that will just do something different. And it makes, it just makes me play, play differently. And it's not necessarily something that the audience is going to hear, mm. you know, um, ah, who cares about that? <laughs> Well, I mean, I think that's where I play best is when I'm not worried about what what the crowd is thinking, and I'm just worried about making sure that I'm having a blast. Um, but yeah, you want to hear some of the sounds? Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh... That's the Dominion Fuzz, the flowery guy. That is made by a buddy of mine, Aaron, in Ottawa. And uh, he's making, like, he was making big fuzz faces, fuzz face clones. He also got a big old... Yeah, yeah, I know a couple of people yeah. who, who have got those. It's, you can't make pedals that are circular. Yeah, there is, you know, as, as nasty as corporations are for doing it, if you have a trademark, you have to defend it. I, to, I do, I do. You legally I do have to defend it. I do get Otherwise, it. you can't defend it. Yeah. So uh, it is not, it's not very nice, but yeah, I don't think they like doing it either. I think Gibson likes doing it. <laughs> I think Gibson likes doing it, yeah, absolutely. But I, I, I do understand... Anyway, yeah, yeah. Anyway. He so he so he started making a, a square version. He made me a big one, which is just beautiful. And so those flowers are the that's the provincial flower of Manitoba is the cro uh, is nice. the crocus. So being Canadians, it was it was kind of nice to bond over that. He makes killer fuzz faces. So this one is awesome. It's got uh, germanium germanium transistors and silicon in it. Oh, nice. So um, it's yeah, it's quite lovely and just that very vintage flavor. Is there another fuzz? Yeah, there's another fuzz. So then the okay. high road is in here. It's labeled Mjolnir because I had a Mjolnir in there, but I just wasn't, I wasn't using any boost because it's plenty loud. And I do, I use the Golden Boy boost a ton. Um, Come on. Woo. Sounds great. Sounds great. A lot more aggression in the mids. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. A little less bottom, which is which is nice because, again, you know, you can get into a lot of trouble with with a lot of low end. So it just kind of it's just kind of very, um, it's it's just sort of 
perfectly usable. Like it sounds, it sounds really, really good. But a lot of those, we, you know, we kind of, we wanted it to be something that's not going to back you into a corner and get you in a lot of trouble. It's got a lot sure. of vibe and it's, and like, a, like a lot of vintage voiced fuzz faces sound amazing on their own. And then you get in a band and it's just it's like, like yeah. you know, and, and so the, the high road, um, is not that. What is it? It's, a silicone fuzz face, or it's, it's it's a silicone based fuzz that's supposed to kind of have germanium sort of feel to it. Okay, which it does, yeah. But it's nowhere near as woolly as a. No, it's nowhere fuzz near. Face. Yeah, which is which is why it's kind of nice to have the the Dominion there as well. It's just a totally different vibe. How lovely. Yeah, and I just step on I step on whatever I'm kind of feeling at the moment, and then and then the last fuzz that's on the board is um, is the Scott McKeon. <laughs> Oh, come on. And I just love, I love the, like, the Stevie Wonder setting. You know? Like the the, the Wonder switch. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. It's a cool thing. We did do it on a pedal jams, I think, many moons ago. Yep, sounded um, just like that. <laughs> yeah, uh, Scott McKeon, a uh, British guitar player, plays with all kinds of people, but also put out a really great album last year. Wonderful oh, man. Album. An Wonderful actual, album. He sent, me, he sent me the vinyl for it, and it was... Uh, uh, when my daughter was born, we listened to it a lot, and it was one of the few records that caught her ear. Like she, she wow. we, so when she was, when she was kind of having a rough night or whatever, I put that record on, and she would just kind of. It was, it was so I texted him was like, my baby loves this record, <laughs> which uh, is mad because it's all full of octopus and. Uh, awesome yeah, but things. it is it's beautiful, like a like a guitar like a guitar driven record mm. that is. Um, so songy, yeah. It's just, it's just stunning. Yeah. 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 Well, you put Scott McKeon, Paul Stacey, Jeremy Stacey, and Rocco Palladino yeah. in a room. It'll never work. <laughs> it, it would, something would have to be quite wrong for that not Man. to work. Yeah, it? yeah. Okay. Look, before we bring Dave in, we, I mean, it would literally take us a week to go through the whole board. We talked about the '68. Yeah. We talked about some of the fuzzes. Um, what haven't we? Do? Condor. What do you use that for? Ah, well, that's great. So actually, there's there's kind of two things um, that I yeah. So the Condor, I don't actually use it for a ton of EQing, but what I do use it for is the low pass filter, which I have set up on the the expression pedal. So. Um, And I just use it for little expressive kind of things, and it's really, really fun. So it's set up as a volume and a, and a filter. But like that reminds me of what they used to do with steel guitars. That's kind of what I was going or, for, or, or at least um, lap steel guitars. That's kind awesome. Of, that's kind of what I was going for, and I got I got really into doing like the tone knob yeah. sort of swells, but it's really hard to do in the Les Paul, and also I just want my hands. So can you swap seats for a sec? I I, I kind of want to hear that. Sure. Is this is this okay where I am? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And it's it's also great, which I don't do much in the show, but but it I'm I'm I mean, probably will write a song using it, but like That's mad because it's kind of envelope filtery, but it also sounds like studio trickery. Yeah, like a you know, like you would get on a on the cliche dance record where they where they go from flat into. Yeah, totally. You get that like. Yeah. But.
guesses with all the harmonics and everything. Yeah, that's incredible. I wow. had I had a I had a compressor on there only for that sound, and I took it off because it was like, oh, I'm not actually using this in the show, and I need the real estate. But then, okay, so the other sound that um, that I use specifically with the Condor is with the um, the ring mod. And I stumbled on this, and I was showing this Dan it earlier. Of course he's got a ring modulator. What do you use that for? Uh, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have, I have a, I have an idea of a place that I want to use it in the set, but there just hasn't been, um, ha hasn't been the the right crowd because it's usually like people are kind of like, <laughs> is he starting something or is he just <laughs> messing around? Um, but that's the Fairfield Electric Electronic, another Canadian company. Yeah. They're Actually, amazing. They make, they awesome make stuff. Just wonderful pedals. Yeah, they yeah. really do. And uh, uh, the guy Knobs, do you guys know Knobs, yeah. the YouTuber? Yeah. He he did an amazing, also Canadian, amazing demo of that. And I was like, I need. Does amazing demos of everything. Yeah. It, it, like the Therme is on my board, the Condor, that, and and the Ring Mod are on my board because of him. And, and then I got him and was just like, well, it doesn't sound anything like that. <laughs> um, but yeah, the... The cool thing about the ring mod is that what like and I again I just stumbled on it by accident but if you tune it to the key you're playing in it uh, the overtones that it oscillates in are super musical so like when you play the third of the chord it, it the overtones make a triad far out just to put some. Uh, sense on that. Joey's only playing one note and the ring mod is doing the rest it's of it. It's kind of filling in, but in a really musical way. And I found that like if I played the third slightly flat, it would sweeten the triad. So if I play it like where the fret is, <laughs> it's one thing, but if I play it slightly flat, and you can feel it drop into tune. Yeah, We've if you want to know why that. that is, watch our last video on guitar tuners. Dan explains why that is. I, I, I felt deep down the rabbit hole. It's like, oh, that's how a ring modulator works. Who thought of that? <laughs> Who was like, yeah, 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 let's let's multiply and divide frequencies. Makes sense. So you play the fourth degree of the scale and, and the overtones create the four chord. Five creates the one chord, but like an inversion of the one chord. And the sixth also makes the four chord. Because we're tuned to C, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, but then I found that it, I won't go through because maybe nobody cares. But if <laughs> if you go through and you tune it to other intervals in the chord, you get a whole yeah. different That's set of really overtones oh that are just as musical. But just, oh yeah, 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 it's just insane. But uh, the the my proudest discovery was like so the in the harmonic series the the there's a flat seven that occurs. Uh, It's quite flat compared to where we would put it here. It's, it's quite out. But if you play it flat, rock and roll. Who cares? The, the, you've so you've got you've got a um with the slide. You've got like built in uh what's that frets. Oh yeah. What are they called? Yeah, those squiggly those frets. Those squiggly frets you got built yeah, in squiggly yeah, yeah. frets with your with your slide. And That's compensated. There you go. Yeah. It, mm -hmm. it, it's 
I'm sure there are many musical users of ring mods out there, but they're not necessarily associated with that. And to think about it in a harmonic sense and to yeah. tune it is... I don't think many ring modulated users are going, now let me think of the harmonic series and the chords of the extensions are going to add to yeah. this. I, I think, think there's Guthrie, a whole think, lot of that going on. I think Guthrie might a little bit. Yeah. yeah oh, yeah. I'm sure. But when yeah, Tony yeah, Iommi's yeah. doing it, I don't think he's going, <laughs> oh, this is going to add a flat five in here. I'm, you know. Yeah. <laughs> No, it's true. Man, that is... I, I cannot wait for the shows. Okay, look, it, we could be doing this for, for literally for days. We're going to get Dave in because we haven't met Dave on TPS before. We've met Dave. But it seems, you know, we talk about the Brothers Landreth a lot. It makes absolute sense to get the other brother in. We're going to have a quick look at a couple of Dave's sounds. And I think we're going to try and persuade you both to uh, maybe, maybe play us out before we uh, do the band session. So um, let's snap our fingers and get David in. And we're back in the room. <laughs> oh, God damn it. <laughs> Welcome, Dave Landreth. Hi. Hey. First time on the show. Uh, I think only the third ever bass player on the show. Unless you count you and me playing bass. You bass count. Like I said, third ever bass player <laughs> yeah. on the show. <laughs> there so. are two things I've always loved about your bass playing, David. Uh, one is your groove and it was it was made up mind that I was like how does he play that because it, you like anticipate the chord changes and the groove is so crazy solid it's like ah that bass player needs to be in every band in the world <laughs> and two your tone it's like I don't know what Perfect that bass, bass is tone. but to me I always associate this kind of P bass SVT yeah. sound with being this giant solid foundation for everything but not getting in the way of the guitars and that that seems to be a part of i mean it, ha, what lit you up about bass playing and what is some of your favorite sounds and does it feed into that um yes yes uh what <laughs> lit me up about bass playing i love i mean initially it literally w was because it was like here you play bass yeah and um but what i've come to really love about it and with so much in life i find like like the out the record that we made it continues to unfold for me i continue to get to know it and learn things from it and appreciate things about it now that we've made it and with bass playing it's like after the fact you know i'm, I'm now i'm now here i am a working bass player and i and we play music for a living but what i've come to appreciate and understand about it is that musically there's this really beautiful thing that happens with the bass where you are a conduit between the rhythm section and the harmony instruments. Right. And, and you get to be this, this glue between these two elements and you really get to interact with both and the things that you do on the bass can, can influence. I can play different root movement that will make what the chord instruments or the harmony yeah. instruments are playing feel very different. I can play an E over a G chord and suddenly it feels sad and heavy. It has gravitas. Uh, or I can play a B over that same G chord. Now it feels like it's really leaning into what? The four chord. It wants to go to that C or whatever. Like I can, I can direct and move things that way. I can change the length of my notes and go from a ba, 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 ba to a ba, 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 ba. Yeah. And now it feels like we're trucking instead of, yeah, yeah. instead of, instead <laughs> of pull or pushing or what have you. And, I really love that. And I also love that the bass kind of sits in the back. It's understated. And my job is to support and serve what's happening on stage. You know, like Joey's at the front of the stage, bearing his soul for the world. What can I do to make, make help him be the best that he can be tonight? Um, and everybody else on, on the stage, I find like bass players make great band leaders for the same reason. Cause I right. think that we have kind of a perspective from where we sit between these two things that we can really help move things along and um so I, I love that i love that understated role i love that it's about service and um and showing up for the song and it's and i like for the most part that it's not really about what i do like people aren't showing up to see the bass or hear the bass <laughs> but without it it's not the same yeah yeah but every single time i've been in a situation where i have to play brothers landry songs with another bass player they always say my God, your brother is such a good bass player. <laughs> because it's yeah. like you you play things in a way that don't necessarily draw attention, but when you pay attention to them, yeah. it's absolutely integral. And like the the way that you change root movement is really, really subtle, and you don't notice it until it's not there. And I remember our dad sat in with us um, for a tour, and our dad is a wonderful bass player. Yeah, but there's a section so. of Let It Lie, the song, 
where the in the pre-chorus where it goes um, um, it goes and what Dave plays underneath that chord progression is everything and if you play the wrong thing and I didn't even notice it until we were playing that's what I played But if anything else gets played over that, it's like, it's not right. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, and I remember having to tell my dad, like, I, I honestly don't know what Dave plays. All I know is that it's not that part. And he was like, is it this? It's like, no. Is it this? <laughs> no. And then it was like, is it this? It's like, yes, that's it. My whole ethos as a bass player is to do more with less like yeah. that was that was always coming up that was the message that was drilled into me from my dad and and some of the best musical also life advice you know um uh, less is more and when i do step out to play something melodically it's almost entirely because like when i i remember pulling that part out because i thought that's what the melody for that was that's just what i heard like because yeah, it's in yeah. the chord voicings that that little melody um but yeah, you just you just sort of play what you hear, and and that that part stuck out, and they just sort of tracked it down, and there it was. And where is tone home then? So oh, can I see flats on there? And I yeah. can hear flats. Yeah, yeah. Diderio Crows. Before this tour, I went and tried a bunch of different strings, um, because, you know, I just was like, there's like there's bass, just like guitar. There are trends and fashions that come and go, and I was watching all these guys play labellas. I was like, oh, well, I love all these guys and I love their tone, so I should probably play these too. And, but this is, these are just the strings that I, I, I uh, have been throwing on my bass for years and years and years, so I'm comfy with them. I, I just love really, really classic bass sounds yeah. from the 70s, P basses. Okay, mm. so it's there. Yeah, it, yeah, and like until I got this thing, um, it's just always been P basses. My dad has a 1980, gave me a 1980 Fender Special P uh, that he had rigged up with two p bass pickups which is a little atypical and which of which i never use the second one i always just use the neck pickup um and uh i've tried all kinds of different and you know like in my early 20s when i was kind of figuring out who i was as a musician and learning all these like really acrobatic bass pieces you have you know? a jacko phase absolutely yeah, yeah yeah and and every bass player should yeah i think um can you still play portrait of tracy no, oh. no, but I, I can play like the first three notes. Can't even get, I got the first three notes. It's literally. the past for me. Yeah. Yeah. Portrait yeah. of Sharon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's in there somewhere. Have portrait of Lacey. <laughs> yeah, portrait-ish. Picture of Lacey. <laughs> uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Yeah, I, play, I played all these different sounds and basses and, and went through that like really modern hi-fi thing right. and spanky yeah. strings and slap, but I can't slap. The bass. Nor should can't. you. Nor I should wish anyone. I could. I, the reason I don't is because I can't. So much of what I play on the bass is because I can't. That that's really what keeps me honest. I'm oh, sorry. Just imagining some of your songs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right? Come like, on, Joey. No, it I, just wouldn't work. I often just say, "Get your thumb off that bass." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not that I don't like slap bass. Sure, if you, there's you know, there's a place for it. There's a place for it. So, <laughs> yeah, classic, classic sounds. And then Joey, yeah. Joey surprised me with this. You got a, you got a pile of guitars from Dusenberg. And was like, oh, hey, I think what happened is, they sent you a bass, or <laughs> you would ask for a bass, and you're like, eh, I'm gonna give this to Dave. I don't know what happened, but I, no, wait. I got you a bass. Is what happened. Is that what happened? Yes. <laughs> I'm very forever grateful because I, I got this thing. It was just like, this is awesome. It sounds like, uh, it sounds kind of like a P bass, but also kind of like a Hofner. Except yeah, right. It plays really, really well and it plays in tune, mm. which the Hofners don't. Yeah. And it's, it's like I've toured around the world with it and I never need to, like, the first time I, I've had it for four years, I've tweaked the front truss, tweaked the truss rod for the first time in four years oh, after right. traveling on three different continents. And your rig for the tour, you've got the Noble Pre. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Paddy uses one. Our, our bass player, the TPS band, uses one of those. Yes, loves it. These are these are one of those things that have become very uh, du jour. 
one of those flavors uh and for good reason like they're just every time an engineer sees one on my board they're like oh great it's gonna be a good day and uh yeah and then aside from that i just have the hx stomp which uh I hate that I love it so much. I know that's contentious. <laughs> but not, the, not around here, it's not. <laughs> they're 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 great. Yeah. They're great. And and the thing that Dave Dave loves um the sound of flip tops. Yes. Yeah. Like the B fifteen. Yeah. And a friend of ours loaned us a really great one, but they don't travel super well and uh-huh. and they're not they're not loud enough. But what we what we found is that we plugged it into the effect return of a power amp. We plugged this thing in with the B15 on it. It was like, holy crap. Sounds kind of like a B15. Sounds ex- like exactly wow. everything we yeah. want out of it. But then then we have the choice of how much power it gets. Okay, yeah. So we're traveling with a with a power amp. And then the the B15 goes in front of that. And then Dave's using a Bareface 212, that uh, bass cap that just sounds incredible. Yeah. Nice. So it's like it's like we, like we never, th- we thought we would have to go searching it's, for. It's really funny. Like I... I've always been, you know, I thought I thought it was a bit of a purist on the amp side. Like I, I like really big, heavy amps, and I've always found that like yeah, my sound comes from like a really big pile of speakers. So I tour toured for years with a six ten, mm-hmm. which is you know weighs one hundred and twenty pounds and is I was never I was always getting chastised for having such an annoyingly heavy rig on the road, but I just was like I need lots of speakers to move a lot of air and I hate the neodymium speakers and. Um, and needed this big heavy amp because I was just like that's where my tone is but what I've kind of realized is that um, they're just those amps are great and I, I just I think maybe I haven't found the one that I love yet and when I do that'll be that'll be something else you know sure. we could talk for days please, and will please 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 uh, check out Come Morning by the Brothers Landreth we're going to do a separate session tomorrow where they're going to play as a band and we'll see how that goes um, <laughs> I can't wait I think it's going to be a technical uh, challenge, but thankfully Ian, the sound guy, is here to help. Oh, brilliant. So okay. yeah. l- less sweating on uh, on my end. But um, please go and check out Come Morning by uh, Brothers Landris and all the previous records. I wonder if you guys could uh, jam us out with something. Would that, yeah, would that absolutely. be sure. okay? Why don't we play a little bit of uh, You Don't Know Me? Okay. You want to do that? Sure.
Far out, man. That's amazing. Wow, how beautiful. Really beautiful. Thank you, guys. Yeah, oh my thanks goodness. so much. Thank uh, you. Such a pleasure. Uh, right. Situation. Link to tour dates below. If you can get along and see the band, please, please do. Check out the Brothers Landreth online. All the usual stuff we normally say here. Thanks for going to that pedal show store. Thanks to our patrons. Thanks to our exclusive preferred retailers. But above all... Oh, goodness, thanks. Thank you, guys, Cheers. so much. Thanks ah. for stopping us. Just, it's always a real joy to see you. And it's great to see you, Dave. Thank you so much. And, yeah. Very glad and we'll see you on Sunday in Bristol. At yeah, Thecla. 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 See you on a boat. Awesome. Nice. <laughs> on a boat. Yeah. Boats and towns. <laughs> okay. See everybody. Bye. See you soon.